Thank you, Richard. Okay, we have uh, uh, some time now to answer questions uh, from the floor, if anybody has one. Uh, there are microphones around, so please wait for a microphone to get to you. Uh, and please tell us who you are uh, when, you, when you ask your question, please. Uh, so any questions from the floor? There's a lady down here, Kim. Um, and I, ju I should just say at this point that uh, Helen's got to race off to Manchester, so uh, if you see her moving about uh, and disappearing uh, through the questions, uh, that's the reason why. Okay, my name's Caroline Green. I'm interested in what you're saying about unconsciousness and anaesthetics, but how do you explain hypnosis? Because that is bizarre. You just go, song. somebody talks to you, and you're gone. But most of the time when people talk to me, I do stay awake and listen. Linda. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> To, uh, to be fair to Linda, I, I think uh, there isn't a huge amount of research in this area. It's something which we've noted before there should be more of. So. Let's, uh, let's see if we can get a question we do know the answer to. Simon Allen, you, you talked about uh, anaesthesia. What is there a distinction then between the sleeping state when you go to, to sleep at night and anaesthesia? Uh, yeah, there, yeah, there is, which is that if, um, if someone's sleeping and you stab them with a scalpel, they'll tend to wake up, whereas with, <laughs> with anaesthesia, hopefully they won't. But then you do have these cases of interoperative awareness where people, to all intents and purposes, seem to be unconscious, but then when they come around, they have a memory of what, you know, they, could, they have a memory of the conversations that were happening in the operating room, or in the worst cases, um, they remember feeling pain, which is the last thing you want. So... Yeah, I mean, that's the main distinction, is that in sleep. But, but what, it's, what, what these um, anaesthesia studies are suggesting is that actually sleep and anaesthesia are on the same kind of continuum. So you pass through this sleep state where you start getting these oscillations of these brain cells, and then more and more of these cells fall into this pattern, and then as that happens, you kind of get to this point where so many of them are in this pattern that the brain is no longer able to talk to itself. What's, and what's, I didn't get, I'm just going to carry on, but <laughs> what, I, what I found really interesting about this, this study um, that was published a few weeks ago is that that's a really individual thing, so the point at which you get this plateauing where your brain cells fall into this thing is very individual, and, um, and this could be used to actually pinpoint the, the point at which individuals lose consciousness, which no one has really been able to do up until now, it's been very kind of hit and miss, and as I said, it's been down to, you know, do they respond when we actually make the incision? There are, there are a few other ways of doing it, but... Um, and it's, it's, it's determined by age as well, so it looks like, as, you know, the, um, it looks like there's a kind of critical threshold at which a certain proportion of your brain needs to be in this state when you are fully anaesthetised. And people who have less grey matter, which tends to happen as you age, actually re reach that plateau earlier than people who have lots of brain cells. Well, I'm like it a lot of the time. Yeah. <laughs> Another question. Gentleman down, down here. Any other questions? Hands up if you've got one. Oh, good, we've got some more. Yep. Alan Porter. There's been a recent newspaper report that um, electron decay can explain the red shift which case there was no big bang. Can you, the panel, throw any light on this, please? Will the new scientists be telling us all about it? Well, I haven't heard of this, and Marcus knows What's far that? more about what, cosmology what, than what I do. Electronica. Um, what I would say is there are so many interlinked observations which, have, which give us our current standard picture of cosmology of the universe beginning in a hot, dense phase and expanding and all the galaxies kind of congealing out of that cooling debris, um, that I don't think there's anyone who seriously believes that that picture is in error. Um, again, you know, if you didn't believe that the, uh, the red shift um, was caused by the, the expansion of the universe and therefore gives you the distance of objects, there's so many other things, like the heat radiation, which is in this room. You know, if we had a television here and we tuned it between the stations, we would actually pick up the Big Bang radiation. As I say, it's the, it's the most obvious 
um, um, striking component of the universe. How do we explain the fact that 99.9% .9 of the photons of the universe are in this stuff uh, if there wasn't actually a hot Big Bang? Okay. And we'll keep an eye out for that research. Uh, some, uh, there's a gentleman down the back there. Come on, this side seems to be doing all the questioning. What's the matter with you guys over here? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Ro Roger Emerson. Uh, a similar question, maybe in a way for Marcus, is, is the, um, the current model of the uh, universe. Um, do you ever uh, wonder that in this model, which has something that we can't detect, uh, dark energy, which has reverse gravity, that we're dealing with the 21st century equivalent of phlogiston. Absolutely. I mean, I think it all the time, actually. I mean, I wrote, I've just written a book called What a Wonderful World, uh, which is about everything from finance to thermodynamics, uh, sex to special relativity. And uh, I gave this book to my editor at Faber, and he, he said, you know, I really like it, Marcus. This chapter on cosmology, it's complete garbage. <laughs> and uh, I thought to myself, I was, I was very worried. I thought, have, have I written it badly? But then he was actually pointing out that, in fact, it is garbage. I mean, when you think about it, when you look at it from outside, 98% of the universe is invisible. 73% uh, is this dark stuff with repulsive gravity. We don't know really what it is. 23% is this dark matter. We don't know what it is. Of the 4% that remains, which is the atomic stuff uh, that we're made of, the stars and planets are made of, we've only ever seen half of it with our telescopes. We, 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 we kind of speculate that the other half might be cold or hot gas between the galaxies that we can't see. So we've built this amazing edifice on, of cosmology, of, of uh, the origin of the universe, on the 2% that we've seen. I mean, imagine if Darwin had only knew about frogs, and he didn't know about elephants, and he didn't know about fish, and he didn't, about, didn't know about trees, and he devised the theory of biology. So, so again, you know, it really is an amazing edifice to have, to, to have built up on the basis of pretty much nothing. And I just would, one last thing, I would say that, that it really it hasn't really, um, most scientists just haven't really grasped that everything they've been studying for the last 350 years is only 4% of what there is. It doesn't, hasn't really affected them, but, but it should. <laughs> Marx, of course, makes his living out of writing about that 4%. So, uh, there's a gentleman down here, and we'll take you in a minute, that young lady at the front there. Thank you. Um, this is a question maybe both for Marcus and Jeff. It involves zeros and infinities. My question is, um, I mean, as mathematical objects, uh, zeros and infinities are very useful. But have they ever been observed in reality? Do they actually exist? Or are they purely mathematical objects? That is a question that exercises a lot of mathematicians. and. Um, the fact is, they're, they're both infinity and zero are clearly useful in describing things. Whether that means they actually exist goes to the, the heart of a whole philosophical debate about whether maths is invented or discovered, which I wouldn't presume to <laughs> give an opinion of on here. But in, in the universe, a standard picture, uh, which is inflation bolted onto um, the Big Bang, uh, in that picture, the universe is infinite in extent. But it's only effectively infinite in extent, because I told you about these bubbles of, of, of ordinary vacuum that form in the, in the inflationary vacuum. We're inside such one such bubble. But the universe inside our bubble is infinite. And now how can something bounded be infinite? It's, it's infinite because the boundary of the bubble is expanding so fast that there is no way we can ever reach it. So effectively, it's infinite. So I suppose you do get these things which are effectively infinite, even if they're not. But has it ever been observed? I mean, can we observe that infinity? It, it no. Is still, it's still a yeah. 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 
has infinitive been observed? Has nothing been observed? No. No, there, are, there is a strand of cosmology that says this is something that we've written about recently. I would, uh, we, we wrote a whole feature about the infinity and whether it's, it is the, the, prob the problematic thing in the universe that, that they don't actually exist in reality and our whole, the whole basis of our cosmology of our maths is thereby wrong. And there are, there are actually people called finitists who, have atte who attempt to rewrite the whole basis of mathematics without infinities, but they are very much in the minority. <laughs> okay, question from uh, up on the... Uh, this is uh, a question from Twitter, and uh, the question is, you talked, Jeremy, about a lot of experiments have to do with the vacuum and finding nothing. Why is mercury always the go-to element for those experiments? Well, mercury is, uh, is very heavy, basically, uh, very massive. That, that's the reason it's used. Uh, the uh, experiment that I showed you by Torricelli had actually been done four years earlier with water. Uh, but uh, where you get 760 milligrams of water, you actually get 10.3 meters of water. So it's not the sort of thing you can do easily in your own laboratory. Uh, so the answer to the question is mercury is... Uh, just it's the right size. Uh, if you think of nanotechnology, uh, which is the, the science of things that are very, very small, uh, mercury works in the centi technologies, uh, the centimeter technologies, and that's the, the realm which we exist in. So that's, the, that's why I'd say for that. Yeah, chap down here in the, in the red shirt. Good to see some people on the right hand side getting, getting to grips with this. Julian Rosello. Um, you spoke about the nocebo effect, and um, I mean, clearly it's not magic or witchcraft. Um, could you shed some light on research that's being done to try and find how um, suggestion connects to physiological change? I, d I did wonder whether I should put any science into my talk. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I'd share a lot of stories with you. There, there's an awful lot of... Um, it, it's a great area to research in because it's so full of colour, but there, there is a lot of research going on. And we, we know that it's not hocus pocus, that the effects are very real. And people have done imaging studies where they, they've looked into the brain and they've looked at the level of certain brain chemicals that increase or decrease. And when people are experiencing extreme nocebo effect, um, the levels of our natural painkillers go down and the levels of our pain-promoting chemicals go up. Um, am I answering your question, or have I gone off on a tangent? Well, you said that there's, a, a, you said that there's an effect. Yes. But what I'm interested in is what might... Well, the, there, there are two things, really. Um, one is expectancy, and the other thing is conditioning. So with chemotherapy, people expect, unfortunately, to feel awful. Um, and expectancy can trigger the nocebo effect. Conditioning is another thing. If you repeatedly have um, a painful experience linked with a particular event, you're more likely for something to kind of trigger that off. Now, I forget which way round it is, but overall, women are more likely to succumb to the nocebo effect than men. Not exclusively. The... Um, the instance I told you about in New York where the girls were, de were developing tics, this kind of thing is predominantly very female. But if you separate it down into nocebo that's linked to expectancy and nocebo that's linked to conditioning, there's a gender divide between the two. And I, I forget which way around it is, but I believe <clears throat> it's in the book that it's men who operate more on past experience and women who operate more on conditioning. I may have got that the wrong way around. So there is psychology that goes in there, and it's important to understand that because that can then lead us to ways of breaking this pattern. And nocebo is costing the drug industry a huge amount of money. When you get these mass psychogenic illnesses that occur, they cost a massive amount of money. The... Um, in New York, the school had to be shut down. They had to spend a fortune testing for all sorts of environmental toxins. In Belgium, a couple of years ago, there was this psychogenic illness that spread, and somebody thought it was related to a contaminant in Coke. And it cost Coca-Cola $250 million to recall all this Coke 
to, uh, you know, basically reassure people. So it's important to work out the mechanisms, both biological and psychological, because if conditioning is at the heart, then maybe conditioning, you can recondition people. You know, they can learn different techniques to help them not succumb and to help correct it when they do succumb. Linda, and on that note, I'm going to disappear because I have to catch a train. <laughs> well, thank you, Helen. <laughs> Linda, were you champing at the bit to get in there or are you just writing notes for the love of it? I was, I was, <laughs> I was writing down features ideas. <laughs> Okay, right. Um, I think we've got time for one last question. Uh, I think there's one up the up the back. Do you back want there. to ask? We've got two people up here who want to, who want to ask a question. You still want in? Um, hi, my name's Anton. Um, this is a question to the speaker about anaesthetic. More of a curiosity. Um, when you're under anaesthetic, do the does your brain function have the ability to dream? Just curiosity. Okay, interesting question. Helen, has anybody looked at that? Uh, Linda, has anybody looked at that? I, I, to my knowledge, I don't think anyone's looked at whether you can dream under anaesthesia. It'd be, I imagine it would be pretty difficult to study. Um, I mean, one, one problem is I mean, people are only just kind of getting to grips with what true anaesthesia is, and then how would you... I mean, you could ask people whether they dreamed or not. I think the answer is no, but... Um, I don't think anyone's actually studied it. Okay, so uh, so from my personal uh, from my personal experience, and of course, anecdote doesn't make data. Um, I have been under uh, anaesthetic a couple of times, and I don't remember a damn thing. Now, what about you? No, like I no. said, I, I right. So, so has anybody here had an anaesthetic and dreamt? Yes, we've got a couple of people down here. Well, there we go. So, uh, so we'll, we'll have to wait for the uh, scientific trial uh, to come out uh, in, in a couple of years' time. But it, might, it could be if you're going through a kind of a, a sleep phase on your way through or on the way back out, maybe you're having a dream then. That's 